Hello and welcome to our When I Dare to be Powerful conference talk. This is the first of a series of online conversations and podcasts that we're having relating to voice as an agent of change, running up to our one day conference in June. The conference will bring filmmakers, artists, writers and activists together with conceptual thinkers and cultural theorists as we ask what voice means to us and hopefully provoke thinking relating to voice as an act of resistance. Please do visit our website where you'll be able to find out more about our one day in person conference taking place on the 21st of June. You'll also find details relating to our podcasts, online talks and of course the conference programme itself and you can register to attend so please do come along we're looking forward to seeing as many people as possible. The link for our website is when I dare to be powerful conference all one word dot wordpress dot com and you'll also find a link via the Bonington website. Please note that tonight's event includes live automated closed captioning ge generated by Teams, and this may include some mistakes. We're grateful that our When I Dare to be Powerful International Conference and Talks have been sponsored and supported by Midlands Three Cities, Midlands Four Cities, Bonington Gallery and the New Art Exchange. So this evening, Dr. Amirka Ajula jones and Trang Dang will both be in conversation with P Professor Athosia. Trang is a postgraduate researcher in literary studies at Nottingham Trent University. She was funded by a Nottingham Trent University Studentship Scheme and previously graduated from Oxford Brookes University with a BA and MA in English Literature. Her PhD project focuses on Jeff Vandermeer's weird fiction, exploring narratives of coexistence between humans and non-humans and the role of new weird novels in portraying the current climate crisis. Her main research interests are contemporary literature, climate fiction, sci-fi, critical theory and continental philosophy. She has published on the topics of animal studies, American culture and politics, and the Anthrop Anthropocene. Amirka has a BA in History from the University of Sussex, an MA in Education from the University of Nottingham, and a PhD in Sociology from Nottingham Trent University. Dr. Aljula Jones's research has focused on race and gender equity using an intersectional lens. Her PhD thesis examined the lived experience of Black, Asian and mixed race girls in predominantly white English secondary schools. Dr. Aljula Jones is part of Conscience Collective, an international network based in the UK, aiming to extend understanding of climate and social justice. Amirka. And um, thank you so much to our uh, esteemed guest today, Professor Antha Zia. I'm so delighted to be part of this discussion with you and looking forward to finding out um, a little bit more about your work and interests. So by way of a brief introduction, um, Professor Antha Zia is a political anthropologist, poet, short fiction writer and columnist. She is an Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology and Gender Studies at the University of Northern Colorado, Greeley. Antha is the author of Resisting Disappearances, Military Occupation and Women's Activism in Kashmir. She was featured in the Feminist 2021 list of 100 women from the Global South working on critical issues. Antha is the co-editor of Can You Hear Me? Kashmiri Women Speak, Resisting Occupation in Kashmir and a Desolation Called Peace. She has a published poetry collection, The Frame, with another collection on its way. Antha's ethnographic poetry on Kashmir has won an award from the Society for Humanistic Anthropology. She is the founder editor of Kashmir Lit and is the co-founder of Critical Kashmir Studies Collective, an interdisciplinary network of scholars working on the Kashmir region. Antha is also a co-editor of Cultural Anthropology. So Antha, welcome. And um, if we launch straight into um, our first question of the evening, how is activism part of your work? <clears throat> 
First, I'd like to thank the organizers, Patricia uh, and others for inviting me to this wonderful series. And I'm glad to be in conversation with you both. Um, thinking about the question, like how is activism part of my work? <clears throat> I'd like to kind of think of um, engaged anthropology first and foremost, because anthropology as a discipline, what it does is, even though it has a colonial past, it has also been known as handmaiden of colonialism because that's the kind of work it has done. But let's think of it in a very decolonized mode, even though that's still very problematic as a as a as a as a move, as a gesture. But for me personally, as a discipline, it has given me a space where I was able to do ethnography and use its power of storytelling. And that's that's where the strength of anthropology lies, and that's where I went uh, initially when I was kind of attracted to the discipline. And through that, through my ethnographic work in Kashmir, being with the people that I was researching and being from the people as well. So as an anthropologist who's also a Kashmiri, a native who was born there, knows uh, what's happening uh, and also has undergone what other Kashmiris are also undergoing. So in, through that emic perspective, you know, you kind of produce a story, which is a humanistic story, which is not being produced by people outside. So I feel like that the, the power of storytelling is very important to me, and that's very central to the kind of academic work I do. And more than the, the stereotypical and the most let's say, most understood definition of activism, uh, I would kind of think of myself as an engaged anthropologist, which is also an activist, and which is also in some, uh, in one of the famous anthropologists' words, also seen as some sort of a militant anthropology, where you kind of are doing an anthropology that is by the people, for the people, of the people which is what ethnography does and a decolonized and ethnography does in this current moment. So so I wouldn't really describe myself as um, as as a regular activist the way we understand it. But where I use ethnography, I use all kinds of research tools that are available to me to do to put activism into words and to give to to create a vocabulary through which we can do activism. Which through which we can make understand make people understand uh, what's what's actually happening inside Kashmir. So in that sense, I could I could say that this is activism that uses all these tools that research gives it, uh, that writing gives it, be that any genre, to present a situation, uh, which is what activism does. It presents a situation and then seeks a solution in in one way or the other. Thank you so much. That's a, a, a brilliant insight into into your work and your approach and the, the power of um, what we can understand of spoken, but also written word um, and uh, within and beyond the academy. Um, following up on that, really, I'd like to just um, ask a little more about what you see as the current context for activists interested in bringing about change in Kashmir. And uh, I wonder about what elements of the situation have remained the same over time and long a long time, and um, what features are relatively uh, recently changed, perhaps since Modi came to power. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I do want to say that <clears throat> activism in Kashmir is is as old as Kashmiris themselves. And I think we can say that for most occupied people, they have been activists one way or the other. If they haven't been activists who are out on the roads every day, they have been everyday activists. And that really changes the definition of what activism means for colonized people, for people who are under occupation. So for me to be able to write something because I have a safe distance from the place, uh, gives me the privilege to even talk about it because at this current moment, because you asked what's remained the same and what has changed, in this current moment, many Kashmiris, writers, they're completely silenced. 
And I will not say they're si they're silent, they've been silenced. And it's a very important moment in Kashmir's political history. Now, this is not the first time that they have been silenced. Every decade comes with a new technology of persecution. And then they get silenced one way or the other, but then they find a way. But I feel like this time around, they are being cornered from every side that's possible because, uh, because of some things that have happened. We might talk about them later. But what is same is which also the international community needs to understand. What is same is that Kashmiris have been persecuted under the Indian occupation from 1947 itself. Nothing is new there. But what has changed is the way <clears throat> the spectacle of power is imposing on Kashmiris. So let's say um, you invoked Modi's name, who's the prime minister of India, a very right-wing Hindu supremacist, uh, connected to one of the oldest militant organizations that propagates Hindu supremacy. So the, he's at the helm of power right now. What they have done is, um, I'll just give you a small example. In 2019, August 5th, Kashmir's semi-autonomy, which gave them territorial sovereignty, just like any independent country, and some autonomy, which was very nominal under the Indian occupation, was militarily taken away. It was literally a siege, a re-annexation of Kashmir, where on top of 700,000 uh, 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 700, military personnel uh, from the Indian army, uh, from other parts of Indian um, forces, and also the local police that is uh, Im a, that implements its own military role on the region. On top of that, 60,000 more personnel soldiers were flown in and Kashmiris were put into months-long siege. To the rest of the world, this was presented as if this was a, a sh uh, this was a lockdown, and this siege was presented as taking away Kashmir's autonomy because uh, to curb terrorism, to curb uh, nepotism, to curb unemployment, and the rest of the world was really most of it was very quiet with India doing such a such an act, a military aggression that it was causing on Kashmiris. So at that time, one member of the previous regime, uh, which is seen as more secular, he told the reporters in India that, that we have actually done the same thing 12 times, meaning the erosion of autonomy. But we did not present it as a military spectacle. We were very discreet. But what the current regime is doing is that they are not uh, apologetic about the direct military aggression that they're causing, at the same time presenting it as if it's for the development of the region. So that's how it's same. The aggression is same. It's only it's camouflaged differently. So there's one quote from a Kashmiri, and it comes from the street, and it's very, very telling and symbolic and very heartbreaking. What he said about... Um, this 2019 removal of autonomy militarily, he said that uh, before this India used to stab us in the back, but now they're just stabbing us from the front. So, so that's, that's where Kashmiris are right now. So what does that mean for the current state of how Kashmiris are expressing themselves? What that means right now is that early on, so many laws have changed in the past four, uh, three, four years. Uh, that it's very hard to keep track. Uh, so right now you have a media gag from 2020. It really is a gag. So earlier there was censorship, <clears throat> but now censorship has been institutionalized. So it's very hard in this atmosphere for people to write. And um, I personally have been part of many projects. And when I say many, it's, uh, it's, it, it is really many projects from different places where we had writers from Kashmir who had to send their work and who were very enthusiastic to write. But slowly, all the projects are quiet right now because people are retracting their work. And it's very heartbreaking for writers not to be able to write. It doesn't mean that they're not personally writing, that, that they're not privately writing, they are, but they just don't want it to become public. And that's that's heartbreaking when you have a moment in history where People in Kashmir are very, very aware of the fact that if they're going to write, they're going to be persecuted. 
So that is the current moment. And that's that's the moment in which uh, people like us who are outside, uh, our, our voices kind of become stronger. Some become stronger, some don't, just to kind of like, you know, keep it going, basically. That's very interesting, isn't it? So the, the, the responsibility, if you like, of a population's exterior to Kashmir, you know, to, to keep stories uh, being told, keep the situation alive in people's mind beyond um, the um, reach of, of the, the government. And um, I think several things that you've suggested um, really uh, resonate with me. And I think there's um, the idea of everyday activism and the public and the private realm. And I think we'll need to come on to those um, themes later. But I wonder if there's something more to be said about how this conflict it, so militarised and so um, uh, re-established in, in really ex extreme militarised um, versions, um, how does that conflict play out distinctly for women, for men? Um, and I wonder if, you know, with your work, uh, if, how, how, how you would see that conflict distinctly for the experience through the lens of gender. So um, <clears throat> I, I do think, you know, in a, in a very decolonial, um, so there is this so, sort of like the Western perspective of looking at conflict, especially that are in the quote unquote third world of which Kashmir is a part, or or we could also say the previously colonized countries uh, or previously colonized lands because there were no countries. Uh, what happens in those places is that we are sometimes forced really to look at it through a gendered lens as if men and women are different parts of the community. I know there are differences, but gender is essentialized in a manner that I don't think serves the local communities as much. So while in my work, I do focus on women because I feel like women are in a double bind, especially when a conflict is heavily militarized, you do have the social patriarchy and then you have the political patriarchy, which not only rules the social patriarchy, but also quote unquote, emasculates men, <clears throat> makes them less, uh, feminizes them. And then the gender dynamics kind of changes in different ways. And then you also have the political military industrial complex, the political military patriarchy atop this entire situation. And what that does is that also brings a lot of sex. Uh, this is a trigger alert. It also uh, brings a lot of sexual uh, violence into play. And which also plays on the bodies of the women in 1994 itself uh, from 1989 uh, when sort of like the armed struggle that Kashmiris are waging and are continuing to wage in different phases and different manners. It was only five years old, uh, formally, uh, that a Human Rights Watch published a report. And again, this is a trigger warning. Uh, it published a report called Rape, Rape as a Weapon of War. Even within those first five years, what had happened was that Indian army was deploying rape as a ma manner of subjugating people and not just women. Of course, women were the double recipients of the violence, but there were men also. And I think that we really need to understand, uh, especially from the inside perspective, like how do men in, uh, in these previously colonized lands, how do they see sexual violence? Like in my work, when I talk to women, uh, and men and other genders uh, on the spectrum, you could kind of like see how each of them was internalizing this and how cultural it was. For men, there was no rape, so to speak, because they portrayed it as torture and it kind of served them in several ways. One, they were not humiliated when they had to talk about the experience. And the second thing was, you know, it, it also kept them intact as quote unquote, you know, their masculinity is intact, they weren't humiliated. So they called it torture. But when I would actually talk to them, and one of them is, one of them I mentioned in the book as well. Uh, he gave me permission to write a story, even though his, uh, his privacy is not breached in any way, but the story is there and the way he talked about it. And it was like two, three years 
into that conversation that I realized that, oh, he wasn't really talking about torture. He's actually talking about sexual violence that was meted on his body. So there's an old statistic, and I'm, I'm sure it's changed now, uh, where um, it was said by the Medicine Sans Frontiers in their own uh, research on Kashmiris, they found that what what a two in seven Kashmiris has either been subjected to sexual violence or has witnessed sexual violence and torture. So that's a huge number. So I would, even though I agree that there are gender dynamics and social patriarchies uh, wreak havoc on women in their own way, but we also have to understand that communities suffer together as men, women, and others. They suffer together. And in that, uh, I I do really urge us as uh, scholars who keep a decolonial lens on the forefront to see the communities together, because these women who are actually suffering, this, let's say the sexual violence or any kind of violence, uh, they do see their communities as one. They don't see themselves as separate from men, because we also have to see that the communities who are most affected are the most marginalized, because most of the militants or the combatants in Kashmir, they came from marginalized uh, families. They, many of them were financially well off and they were also leaders and also soldiers, but many of them are also from financially marginalized families and communities which don't have the wherewithal of um, sometimes not even being formally educated, not having uh, financial privileges. So the, the women and them, they are, they're really bound together. So for example, uh, my primary work, which the book is based on, is on the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons. These are actually mothers. One of the mothers became the co-founder of the movement uh, in search for the disappeared persons. Now, who are the disappeared persons? These are Combatants as well as non-combatants, more non-combatants from 8 to 45 years of age, and most of them bearded because they look Muslim, who have been disappeared by the Indian army and other government, other forces of the Indian uh, apparatus, Indian occupation. So about from 8,000 to 10,000 people have been disappeared. So there was this really strong movement going on from the 90s uh, till recently when government really banned all the protests that are happening publicly. So what, what these mothers used to do was mothers and uh, half widows because the men they didn't know whether they were alive or dead. So they have been termed as half widows. So the activists of APDP, uh, they, they, they would go out and they would uh, protest there are two factions right now, and one of them would protest on the 28th, and the other one would do it a little earlier. So most of the times, this was like a politics of mourning that they were deploying. And uh, and in my analysis, I was initially looking at it as a very gendered struggle. But then when I really looked at the depths of it, I felt like men had done their part in that, in kind of helping them formulate this. And then the women took over. Because and of several reasons, because, you know, when women gather together, they're not seen as an equal threat, as if when men would get together and protest against the military. So women are not seen as an equal threat. They're seen as lesser. But then at the same time, they're very vulnerable to physical assaults. They're very vulnerable to uh, be sexual violence being meted on them. So, so there were like so many elements that came to light when uh, suddenly I saw it as gendered movement for a reason. But then at the same time, I saw how men had in the on the backstage kind of helped. Uh, and because there was a lot of security discrimination against men, why they could not come to forefront as the movement. So I'm not saying that I'm not taking anything away from women's activism, but I am saying I'm also kind of like trying to present why men are also uh, part of the movement, but not seen as such. So while it's a gendered movement and it has produced many changes for women, especially from becoming accidental activists to becoming re quote unquote real activists for the movement and becoming face of human rights defense inside Kashmir. They're, they're a very famous movement. The leader of the movement currently, Parvina Ahangar, she's quite famous, very well known. She's also known as the Iron Lady of Kashmir. So while all of that is happening, um, I, I, I think it's very reductive to see it only as gendered and that to gendered, uh, quote unquote, vis-a-vis -vis women, so to speak. So I feel like there is a little bit of decolonial element that we have to dispense, uh, sorry, implement now and then. 
uh, to see them as I also feel it's a pitfall because then um, the Indian government also uses men against women and women against men and further implode their communities. So, so that's something that I always uh, keep in mind when I'm thinking about this movement that is so gendered. Fascinating, really, really fascinating. And it really it gets to the heart of voice, whose voice, who speaks for who, who can speak. All of these major questions uh, that we'll be trying to, to get some kind of um, answer to in the coming weeks through the conference uh, build up and then it, on the day itself. But you certainly have really illuminated something really important here. Um, I think um, you've started to tempt us with the idea of um, your work and um, your poems um, through the, the um, discussion already. But I think it might be now um, really interesting for people to hear an extract from some of your um, or one of your poems. So um, I wonder if you could just briefly introduce which one you've chosen and why. And and then perhaps we'll move into really looking at that that aspect of um, the, the the poem as as a, a vehicle for voice. Okay, <clears throat> it's very hard to choose. <laughs> oh, yes. It's it's very. Uh, I feel like oh, this one portrays this better. This one says this better. So, um, but I feel like uh, I, f I feel like for me personally, uh, I know that we're going to talk about poetry after a while. But I think. Uh, personally, uh, for me, poetry always has been a medium of expression. I don't know if I'll all if I'll if I'm a good poet or a bad poet. I just I'm, I'm I just write. <laughs> it comes to me. I write and I I I don't try to edit it a lot. As I said earlier, you know, when people make me edit poems, and I I feel like uh, that's um, we should have a decolonial mood that says I resist <laughs> editing too much. <laughs> it has to. And I'm also a woman. Uh, I'm also a mother. I feel like uh, when I write, uh, it should have um, it should have the. I mean, my kids are old now, but I was writing when they were little, uh, and I was also finishing my dissertation when they were little. When poetry was becoming more and more part of what I was doing, I used to think that what uses a poem if it doesn't have pitter patter of these little feet, and it's not edited to death as if I was sitting in this cabin on the mountains and writing and not taking care of my kids and, you know, cooking at the same time and finishing a poem. So I don't know what the audience and the listeners are going to think of these poems, but I feel like um, there's one, I, I wrote uh, a series of ep epigrams uh, during uh, the siege of 2019. The siege lasted, uh, and you know, if you are going to Google the siege of Kashmir, I don't think you'll find the word siege anywhere because the Indian government portrayed it to the rest of the world that there was a lockdown for the safety of people because they will come out on the streets and protest uh, when they were taking the, when they took the autonomy of Kashmir or semi-autonomy of Kashmir militarily and they, they actually re-annexed it. So I was... I was maintaining a city, uh, a daily journal, so to speak, which I called the Verse Journal of Siege. And it ended up uh, some 150 plus uh, epigrams. So each day things were happening in Kashmir and media was banned there. International media later on, even BBC was banned. Uh, so there was little news trickling out of Kashmir. It was completely in a communication. Uh, it had disappeared, so to speak. There was an enforced disappearance of the region. Even um, Genocide Watch, they they issued an alert on for the region at that time. So, so I was doing these epigrams. So one epigram I'm going to read, which was the 77th day of Kashmir siege, and it's 2010, 2019. And this kind of uh, this kind of gives a context to why poetry. Good. And it's just one line. <laughs> After they barricaded every street snatched the guns and kitchen knives, we picked poetry. So that's kind of like uh, a contextual element in why poetry. So there's a safety to poetry, but then it also is very unsafe. And it does, it do, it, it does create, a, so it, it, it is politics. It is linked to politics. It is linked to resistance. 
So that's one uh, epigram. Uh, but then uh, I could also, um, so the other, other poem is, it's also a very short poem. It's just four lines. Uh, you can call it whatever verse, epigram. Uh, but, you know, any Kashmiri who speaks writes against the Indian authorities, against the Indian occupation, against its government, against its ideology, especially if they're Kashmiris. If they, and if they're resisting through arms, they're called militants, used to be called. But now India completely criminalizes the resistance movements and calls them terrorists. And people who are writing, they are being portrayed as intellectual terrorists. So when you write about, when I think about like, what does war on terror look like from our perspective? So, and this is what also poetry gives me because, it, you know, words have power. That's why we call them, they have power. They, they, they have a, uh, you know, th that, that's why we call it kind of spelling because we are creating this power. And I feel like we need to invoke this power. So what does uh, what what does war on terror look like when I when I invoke war on their terror, state terror, the nation state's terror? So I say that I'm so full of hope, like old men's prayers, a dog's look, a woman's touch. So that's a very short one. And if there is time, I could read one which is slightly longer. Is there, do we have time? Okay, yeah, that would yeah. be great. Thank you. Oh, so I there's this interesting poem that you might be, uh, all might be interested because this grew out of, uh, this actually is a result of a project that I did with um, Dial a Poem Project, which comes out of Nottingham Trent University and you yeah. have a phone booth somewhere which you, where you dial and you can listen to a poem. So this poem is there, so I might read it. And this uh, this project was about uh, sort of like understanding or analyzing connection between the telephony and poems, poetry. So for Kashmiris, uh, phone is a very potent thing because it's a potent and a tragic thing because the service is not always available. You know, it can be disrupted anytime. It's it's one of the it has it holds India holds the record for. Uh, suspending the internet in Kashmir, I think for more than 129 times in a year or more than that. So phones, even that during that uh, the siege of Kashmir in 2019 and early 2020, uh, phones were completely dead. There was no internet. There was no basic cable. Uh, you could hardly know what was happening in the region. So this is basically that. And it also invokes uh, Britain because Britain has a huge role in what is happening in Kashmir right now. So maybe the audience will be interested in this. So the poem is titled, I should warn you, I'm not a very good reader of poetry. So <clears throat> in Kashmir, all phones are dead. That's the title. In Kashmir, all phones are dead. The cold gag is strong in the air. Deep-rooted chinars, chinars are maples, deep-rooted chinars lift <clears throat> their icy arms to heavens, praying for the spring's thaw. Your Britain is cold too, but your phones will always work. You can call mother when finally you decide to return her call. I wish I could do that, you know, shrug my mother off, but she has too many worries. Her woman's world doubled. Soldiers crowd her dreams. Ghosts of disappeared boys knock at the doors. She never sh knock at the doors. She never shuts. Tying countless worry knots, praying to the God of mercy to watch over me because she cannot. Kashmir, it's angelicized cashmere. Sounds like an old sweater, moth-eaten, handed down. But I promise. Even if it were a garment, the shearing, scouring, scouring, grading, sorting, carding, spinning, weaving was done in England. So this is your sweater. No, sorry, I mean your story too. But Kashmir is not a ball of wool. Kashmir is a hearty people and the softest, most fragrant earth. 
where the crown's yellowing phantom still exists in old files, unburied in broken tin trucks, shape-shifting into bullets, tear gas, pepper gas, God, the spices still, pellets, prisons, and gags, all accoutrements of torture and tyranny. Jellum, which is the river. Jellum is a slow-moving funeral carrying children, killed, dismembered, whose mothers wait for a phone call, praying they're just being like your young people, careless and alive. But mothers know, they won't know. Curfew is a glacier growing large in the heart of a city. Streets are icy, cold, empty of breath, except for silence, dogs and soldiers. All phones remain dead. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think if we pass the question that on to Trang, that would be um, a good yeah. timing. Yeah, thank you so much. It has been wonderful to hear your discussion, you know, your insight into what's going on in Kashmir um, and also to hear about your powerful poetry. I, I, yeah, I, I read some of them and yeah, I just love them. Um, so what I'm interested in is the ways in which do you choose different forms to write your poems? And I just wonder, as a literary student, um, whether you kind of have a structure of a poem ready, you know, before you even write the poem or whether you kind of it come naturally to you as you write it, um, and how does that help you to kind of channel or kind of describe um, an amplify voice um, as a kind of an act of resistance in your work? Thank you. That question makes me uh, think. I I, I think uh, I'm I'm not a professional. I haven't. I'm not a. I've not been trained as a writer professionally. Uh, I have been writing poetry for a long time, and I used to write in Urdu and Kashmiri uh, before I. Uh, decided full time to write in English because I felt like it has more audience even amongst our own people. So Kashmiris have been writing for the longest possible time, but it's just that uh, English, uh, with its all the post-colonial fuel that it has, it's more well received. So regarding like how do I uh, do I have a layout of a poem or how do I write write a poem? It's really become interesting to me as I grow old, old and older. I feel like earlier I used to think about a poem. I used to think about something, an idea that would come to me, and I would be like, "Oh, I, I have to write it in a this this manner." And then I I really also tried to follow sort of like this, you know, how how professional writers would write. But I think at some point you you get tired of reading all that and following these rules and regulations. You're like, you know, this is coming to me in some form and let me write it that way. And I really was, I think I personally, I don't know how it sounds to people who are reading it sometimes or who are listening to a podcast where I might have read a poem. I don't know how it sounds to them. But at the same time, I feel like... Uh, having the idea and just letting it kind of simmer for a little bit earlier I used to be very greedy when an idea would come to me I would like I have to write it down now so that I don't lose it because it used to feel very valuable but as you grow older you feel you feel like things don't have as much value as you think they have for you you know you know the world can still go on if you don't write that idea down so and you will still live if you forget it so so I, I kind of am patient with the process now but I don't know if that's part of the process. So I, so I, I really uh, appreciate my uh, self to kind of have the idea, let it simmer for a little while, and then just just write about it. And if it doesn't take a form in my head, I don't I don't really uh, ha get, give it any shape on paper because I feel like if the words flow in some manner, uh, they have they have an organic arrangement. The, that's that really works for me I I I I, I mean and, and if you were to ask me like which poets do I idolize or read or um I, I think the only poems I, I read Aga, I used to read Aga Shahid Ali a lot who's a Kashmiri poet a Kashmiri American poet and then eclectically all po poets I there's not one single poet because everyone has their different different ways of writing and uh you are sometimes impressed and sometimes not but I think I don't really want to fit the poem into any category and I don't really want to and I'm not a big fan of giving it a vo voice and there's two reasons for that. there's maybe just one reason for that because you know 
so the poetry that I did in the book uh, on resisting disappearances, there are four, there are six, seven poems that are uh, accompanying the ethnography. And my biggest worry was because most of that was really inspired by the voices of the women that I was talking to and men that I was talking to and, you know, the general community that I was talking to. They were talking about Kashmir. They were talking about disappearances. They were talking about activism. They were talking about everyday activism, which we earlier talked about. So <clears throat> some of the conversations were so potent and potent and symbolic uh, that they would I used to call it, and I have written this in the book, that it's an ethical surfeit in my brain. Like one brain was doing the ethnography, the other brain was really writing poetry. But the poetry was also voices of people. So I, I don't really think that I want to take up anyone's voice and pretend that even in poetry, I'm representing someone or something. So I really prefer it just if it just comes in my voice and comes organically. And, and just flows. And I, I don't really want to sort of like push it. But over over the years, what I really have become a, a fan of is shorter poems, not longer poems. Like the shorter, the better. Uh, and it's also, you know, it's also a gendered thing. Um, I'm also a busy mother, uh, even though like my children are older now. But, you know, as a m mother, as a housekeeper, so to speak, and a homemaker and a professional, there's not a lot of time to, you know, write down, write uh, Salman Rushdie level <laughs> convoluted uh, flights of fantasy kind of thing. And also uh, the matter of at hand is really, uh, for me, it's life and death. So I really, really want to cut to the chase. So I find myself writing shorter, writing smaller and trying to be very as pithy as possible. Um, and I also sometimes feel like I wish I was just writing about simple things and not things that that really are life and death. And and to think that when you write this in words to a lot of people, it doesn't seem like as if it's some kind of a contribution. It's just poetry. Uh, and that's something that we really need to think about, that, you know, poetry is is political. Art is not a luxury. Poetry, resistance poetry is not a luxury. It's a responsibility. It's it's a it's a sort of witness. So yeah, that's I, I don't know if I really answer your question. No, absolutely. But... Yeah, it's a really interesting position and a perspective into you know how you used poetry not to kind of talk about your voice, but actually giving voices to other people actually fit into a kind of really interesting reflection. My reflection on you know the work around um, just sort of you know even human to non-human voices in general, and mm -hmm. it's just the idea that often people say. Um, well, we, we must give agency, we must give voice to marginalised people around the world. But also at the same time, what I can see in your work is this idea of Kashmiri people don't portray themselves as, you know, victims, rather as fighters, you know, rather not objects, but actually subjects of their own stories, their own um, history. And so I just wonder whether you could say more about are people, you know, or do people always already have a voice and agency um, and rather it's time to recognize and hear them rather than actually giving them those things that makes sense yeah I, th I think that I, I make it very clear I haven't really I, ha I have started writing about this because I feel like many times when uh, especially if you are outside the place where this uh, violence is taking place uh, you have the privilege and you have the safety to write and suddenly it's as if you giving voice to someone but I feel like people already have a voice. This is this is just providing a witness of that voice. This is not, I, I, it's not as if I'm providing a voice to someone. I think the biggest voice that Kashmiris or any occupied people can uh, give to the rest of the world is their everyday activism. Is there is the is the the struggle for whatever it is that they're seeking. So uh, you can, you can see in Kashmir today. Uh, the combatants are dying like anything. They're being killed, not dying. They, they're being killed every day. So they, they are giving voice in a different manner. It's just a different way of giving voice. Whether the world might uh, condone it or condemn it, that's, that's not what they care for. Uh, and then the other people, like just regular people, regular Kashmiri people, everyday activism. That's how I see. I mean, right now, a lot of 
the Indian narrative is based on the normalcy in Kashmir. For them, if Kashmir is quiet, if there are no protests, if there are people who are not writing, they're trying to portray this to the rest of the world as normalcy, as people being quiet and happy with India. But then you don't have such silent people, such a silence, this deafening silence that's that's permeating the Kashmiri community, society at this moment. You don't have such quiet people even in India. You don't have such quiet people in, you know, the, the, the maybe whichever is the happiest place on earth, uh, even Disney for that matter. You don't have such quietness. You don't have such a deafening silence. So that 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 should make us ask uh, questions about the silence that permeates and the normalcy that is being uh, portrayed is present in Kashmir. So, so even that silence, you know, this a lot of people might think this might be stretching too far. But, but even the the huddle that Kashmiris are in right now, which is for self survival and consolidating whatever is left of their dignity, whatever is left of their political desires, I feel that is their act everyday activism, and we have to recognize that and we have to honor it. So. When you see that and then you see people like me or, you know, people in diaspora who are speaking about Kashmir, it seems like, oh, you know, we are we are representing something. Uh, but what is they're already representing themselves. It's just a matter of pro uh, pro producing witness in a coherent form, in some form. So I always like to say that Kashmiris have written, spoken and been active for the last 74 years. Why is it that? I wrote a book and it seems like, oh, I have written the story of Kashmir. It's not been done for the first time. It's how the West understands the story. Because I came here, I trained in their idiom, and then I produced a story that they can understand. And that's the post-colonial malaise, rather a very new imperial malaise. And that's what we have to, if we think of ourselves as scholars of decolonization, that's what we have to come, you know, bring to light that we are not representing anyone except for myself and how I see the story. Uh, the people have already represented themselves. If there was no representation, there would be no witness. Absolutely. I think, you know, I really like um, your kind of saying or to Amir Khali, or, you know, people in Kashmir are not silent. They are silenced. So mm -hmm. they're being silenced by, you know, the Indian government and, you know, other kind of pressing power. Um, and, I just want to kind of draw a bit more on your, you know, saying about the idea that we need to bear witness to what's going on. And that reminds me of a um, sentence that you wrote to one of your introduction to the poems, um, that poetry makes one a witness rather than just an archivist. And I find it really interesting and moving in a way because I've read your poems um, and it's you know, really emotional. Um, and my understanding of this is also that maybe you're saying that poetry makes things kind of present and there for people mm -hmm. to, to see and, you know, kind of um, allowing us to face them, the events and the people more directly rather than just kind of push them back to the past. And I just want to ask whether that's a fair observation and whether you want to say more about that particular sentence that you, you wrote. So I, I felt like, you know, when I wrote that sentence, I was also in a very, uh, I was in a zone of uh, sort of like thinking in more technical terms about what, what does poetry do for me. Maybe I would not draw such strict boundaries bet between being arch archivist and witness, but, but to me, witness is more like, so archivist is a very, it's a very deliberate situation where you choose some, because archive is not unbiased. Archive is a very biased thing. Even museums are very biased things. You know, you choose to curate things in a certain way, choose to curate some way, some things, and choose to not curate other things. So for, for a witness, it's uh, you see and you say everything and whatever you can present witness to. So that's what I kind of like used to see it. Uh, but, you know, someone can say that I am biased the way I write things, whether in poetry or in research. I am also curating things. So we can never be not biased. We'll always be biased. We'll always have a perspective because we all have a positionality. So um, and that's the beauty of doing ethnography, uh, because ethnography takes all perspectives into consideration and then produces the story and also keeps in mind that I'm a human, too. I'm a Kashmiri. I'm a woman. And when I moved to the West, I'm uh, I'm Muslim, brown, 
women and you know all these iterations of different in- intersectionalities so which keeps changing so i keep myself really grounded in the research i'm doing not to produce all subjective research but to pre- present research as research but also to say that you know hey everything is subjective so that's where the witness and the archivist kind of uh, demarcation came into play so i would say you're very close to thinking what i am thinking but i'm also thinking now that was written almost 10 years ago i'm now thinking like does it even serve us anymore you know thinking about witness and archive because these are also like theoretical boundaries that have been presented to us by uh, eurocentric scholars in some ways and i i am really actively looking at uh, our own uh, people who have written and how do they see uh, themselves and then some limitations that in that would be that we have been very um, even though kashmiri uh, is a 3000 year old language and it does have a lot of literature uh, and a lot of literature pertains to different times in occupation um, of the people under different rules especially actively from the last 700 years so there is a lot of li- lot of literature out there and which really has to be excavated and seen from a perspective that we understand occupation now uh, because you know occupation also is different when you think before uh, colonization quote and quote or formally ends in subcontinent so that also comes to play so i am really rethinking some of the things that i've written uh, in a good way <laughs> not in a bad way i'm not disowning them um but i also i'm 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 trying to think in more decolonizing terms absolutely i think i think the archive is in a poet i even i think had an ethnographer mm-hmm. can coexist with each other right to show you that you know the past actually still happening now you know you're, you're saying about the kashmir conflict happening ages ago and it's not something new it's actually still playing out to us today and so it's important for the poet to witness what's going on and perhaps with archive is to dig down to the past see what happened and reveal that to the audience and i think that's a kind of maybe beautiful kind of observation perspective that you just give us there um yes, like so, I, i feel like yeah. uh, kashmir is an it's an endless or a continuing past that's what we are Absolutely. arriving in this moment yeah mm-hmm. and not just kashmir yeah. most of the world's conflicts that uh, that we deal with from palestine uh palestine to you know the situation of the you know the indigenous people here or in australia or uh, to thinking about arakan so all of these you know when you look at them they are the, these are continuing pasts that are unfolding before us and until and unless we don't really look at what the indigenous people are saying rather than translate them from outside uh, i i feel like we we'll, we are we can easily say that everything is terror when it meets the neoliberal states the necropolitical states but when you look at it from within people's perspective you see that actually resisting uh, outside forces just like you know classic colonialism but but in a different form in the form of corporations in the form of even the word development i mean i uh, i i i looked at it from a research perspective but then i also like tried to you know was was thinking about different words that we're using and they came out in form of poetry because you know the word development is so violent when it happens on indigenous people you move them from the center to periphery and from periphery to annihilation and that's what's happening to kashmiris in the moment no one is really thinking about indigenous rights when we think about kashmir everyone is thinking about yeah. the electricity that is going to be generated from kashmir from the rivers that it has from the most important resource that kashmir has which is its rivers and other resources so no one thinks about indigenous rights because the neoliberal state portrays everything all kinds of businesses this extractive economy that is being imposed on them as development so thinking about development um, in research time terms is one thing in an academic article is one thing but uh, to to kind of like use it as a device and to kind of uh, analyze it through poetry is also very significant for me because i feel like i have these various tools that i can use to to suss out these different meanings for as as it happens to kashmiris in this current moment and there are many other researchers and writers and activists who are doing the same for other struggles absolutely um and i think that's why your work's so important in terms of you know 
staying true to people's voices and bringing multi-perspective, multi-voices to kind of, you know, open up their stories and reveal them to the world. Um, and I could see that there are questions coming in from uh, the audience, so I'm just going to ask one final question. Um, are you hopeful about the situation of Kashmir? And if so, what gives you hope? So, say that again, I just lost you for are a Are you minute. hopeful? Are you hopeful about um, the situation of Kashmir? And if so, what gives you hope? I think for people under occupation, not just Kashmir, uh, hopelessness is a luxury. And we can't have that luxury of hopelessness. I think hope is everything. And there is there is hope because I do see uh, I, I do see a lot of processes for solidarity that have been put into motion. And I do see there is um, our climate and the the way Kashmir is in this moment, even if you look at through the the Anthropocene and you kind of like use that lens, you see, the current world, the way we are as big behemoth countries, and we're also like pushing this Westphalian Eurocentric democracy that really, uh, we don't know if it really works even for the West as well, not just the non-West. So I feel there is a lot of uh, possibility of hope, uh, especially amongst people who are thinking through their indigenous lenses and are using a decolonized lens, not just to uh, not just for activism, not just only for political purposes, but also rethinking um, basic things, even from poetry to fiction uh, to nonfiction, using their indigenous lenses. I feel like that's there's there's power in there, and I do see those movements here. I see that kind of solidarity, and I I do see how we are connecting these struggles. They don't seem really different after we cross the cultural barriers. We are all acting against neoliberal, necropolitical, capitalist states, basically, which really want to mush peoples together and create artificial boundaries. And I think there is a movement against that. It, it might seem small. I don't think it's small. I, I think there is a lot of growing sentiment. There's a lot of scholarship. There's a lot of activism growing around that kind of solidarity where we see, you know, some years back there were protests in Chile. And there have been, there are always protests and um, struggle and resistance in Gaza, in Palestine. And then there is struggle and resistance in Kashmir. And I saw these photographs and I'm not just uh, sort of like, I'm not uh, undermining these struggles by just symbolic of photographs, but the photograph from Chile was the same. It was a, it was a pellet gun that had been used on the crowd. And there was, the, uh, you know, there were these damaged eyes uh, and, you know, you can see these photographs from Chile to um, uh, even Argentina to Kashmir to um, to Gaza, and you see this symbolism. And then you kind of start thinking about uh, why pellet gun? Why is pellet gun being used on people? What what are the reasons? Where do they come from? Who is prof profiting? You know, basically what we are also witnessing is war profiteering inside Kashmir at this moment. I mean, development to me means war profiteering, where people have to be killed. They have to be killable bodies. They have to be expendable bodies that can be killed easily so that people can do business on them. So we've seen that over and over. And you know what's the surprising thing? The surprising thing is that the necropolitical nation states, they have to eat their own as well. So while India is eating and killing Kashmiris, it's not leaving the people within its own peripheries. Whereas when we see what is happening to indigenous people, whereas when we see what is happening to Indian Muslims, whereas when we see what's happening to Indian Christians and other minorities, as they use the word for people who have a lesser population. So there are these connections. And uh, I see these connections being made visible. And that's also translates into solidarity. And I don't think that's 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 less material for hope. That's a lot of material for hope. Yeah, absolutely also, great. And yeah. also in people's survival, you know, the tactics of everyday survival and everyday activism. Everyday survival under occupation is resistance, is hope. So if they are living and if they are using silence as a tool uh, to really consolidate, uh, that's that's a lot of hope right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the sentence, um, hopelessness, 
it's a luxury to have we'll stay with forever and mm-hmm. it's just really empowering and powerful um and thank you so much Atha, for your insights it's been really educational it's yeah been wonderful to have this conversation with you we've learned a lot i'm sure amika would agree as well um and now we're just going to move on to the q a sessions and i can see there are questions uh from the audience so if i just take one first and amika you um, might want to take the next one yeah um, so there's a question from um, Sanjay. Um, what's your opinions regarding the pers- persecution faced by Kashmiri pandits on the grounds of their religion? And do you feel that we must address them as well when we ensure a fair society in the region? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's a it's an important question, I think. Uh, so the question is like persecution faced by Kashmiri pandits on the ground of their religion. I do, uh, you know, the... The two communities, you know, Kashmir uh, has had a what is really shown by India in the Indian narrative as a syncretic past, where two communities or more than two communities of different religious uh, inclinations and uh, predispositions have lived together in a very in harmony. But I think that's really a myth. Uh, and we re- need to rethink that, not in a bad way, but in a good way. And then uh, and I'll tell you what the good way is. So the persecution, the two communities were used against each other, especially, and that's when uh, the pundits migrated from the region because as pundits and as uh, they were known as pundits, but now it's mostly uh, the, 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 the title for them is Hindu pan, uh, pundits. Uh, but I still kind of see them as Kashmiri pundits because that was the preferred uh, tra- title early on. Uh, they, because of the, the the Hinduism, because of the religion, they did a side with India. They wanted the they were most of them did support the Indian rule, and most Muslims, um, and many of the there were m- many pundits too who supported independence. In fact, there are several pundit leaders who who either supported Pakistan and also supported independence. So initially, in the initial days of uh, armed struggle, there was. Uh, communal violence. There was persecution, uh, persecution of people who were siding with India. And majority of, if you make a Venn diagram, majority of the pundits did uh, side with India. There were Muslims who were also collaborators and sided with India, and they also faced persecution and had to leave the region. So, but most of the Hindu co-religionists, they had to move out because there was persecution going against everyone who was siding with India. And in that milli, what you see is people who were also not political, you know, from the Pandit community. They were just, you know, they were just Pandits. They were just, uh, quote unquote, following that religion. Even if they were not political, they also suffered persecution. So that persecution is there. And I think uh, we have to address all forms of persecution that have happened. And we cannot say that one pain is less and one pain is, one's pain is more. It's kind of, uh, if you look at the Muslim community, the kind of uh, persecution they have faced at the hands of Indian authorities and Indian occupation and the kind of migrations that have happened within that community in the last 72 years f- uh, to the other line of con- the, the, there's the line of uh, control, the ceasefire line between two Kashmiris. So many uh, Kashmiri Muslims in the last 72 years have left the Indian controlled Kashmir for uh, the Pakistan administered Kashmir or Azad Kashmir as it is known. So yes, there has been communal persecution and uh, and that is a reality and I think that needs to be addressed, but it needs to be addressed on genuine basis uh, where religion kind of collates with um, which mm, country you're siding on and the persecution is based on the political ideology more than religion but then religion collates with it does that make sense so so that's one uh, and the other side of it is that you know when you are thinking about countries and a vision for kashmir you're not just thinking of kashmir for muslim kashmiris and you're not thinking about you know i i really think that the need of the hour we really need to think creatively about kashmir is kashmir and one of the things that india talks about is the different ethnicities inside Kashmir and how they cannot form a nation of their own or not having one language across the region. So when we when India talks about itself, it talks about its diverse people and says that we have diversity, we have unity in diversity. 
But when it thinks about Kashmir, it presents its diversity as if there is going to be no uni- unity. But you know that happens. You know, every struggle, every people when they do a, they conduct a struggle. They are in a struggle. That's what the big nation states and big colonizing states say that you know your diversity is not. It can never produce unity. India spent almost forty years with the British trying to tell them how their diversity can be unity. So. I mean, Kashmiris are also doing the same thing. And then there are, uh, I mean, I wouldn't like to, there is no rose-colored spectacles here to see the communal divisions inside Kashmir, which I think after 2019 are going to be irreparable between the two communities of the Kashmiri Pandits and Kashmiri Muslims, because that's how the current government really plays. That I, I really see that these two peoples, it's a tragic uh, um, way in which they have been used against each other and continue to be weaponized against each other. If you look at the personal level of people, my p- father passed recently, last month, and mm, some of the sort of like the pivotal mourners of his passing were his pundit friends. Uh, so who who kind of like trooped in from all parts of India, parts of Jammu, and parts of the valley, because many of them still, around 3,000 plus families are still in the valley. And they trooped in to mourn him. And uh, they were they were, they were, the, they were his pivotal friends. So on one hand, we have those stories of communal harmony, but I also think we have to think about the moment of Kashmiri Pandit migration in the 90s. It can't happen overnight. You cannot fan the flames of distrust overnight. There has to be something subterranean, some difference within the communities that has already been there present and that has been weaponized by the big nation states or whoever is ruling them. And I think for that, both Kashmiri Pandit and Kashmiri Muslim communities need to think without these ruling parties weaponizing them against each other. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say that pundits have right to return. There is right. I say there is no right to return. They just return because they belong to the land. Who is giving them to the right to return when they have that inbuilt in them? So, so you know, we have to think on th- those lines. I mean, uh, when we are thinking about uh, Kashmir, we are thinking about Himalayan states. These are states that are at the epicenter of an economic, uh, ecological disaster. If we are not thinking creatively about these uh, places, if you're not thinking about decolonization, if you're not thinking about demilitarization, Kashmir is a soup bowl right now. Even a little rain turns it into a big soup bowl where there's inundation and no one is really thinking about why is this happening? How much load this uh, this country, which is uh, merely the size of Britain, I think, and the Indian army holds the size of Dallas in it. And think about how much overload that uh, uh, that place has. And then to top it all, the other economic ecological disasters that are happening and other ecological stresses that are present on that land. So we really need to think about uh, these places. And I'm ta- of course, I'm talking about Kashmir in a very creative manner. Do we, ha- do we need new ways of understanding how to govern people in a certain place? But first and foremost, we do have to think about ways of decolonizing and also how do we de-weaponize these communities against each other and 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 how are they going to come together without artificially telling them, oh, you know, you have communal harmony, which I don't really buy into. I feel like we haven't really contended our history properly as Kashmiri Muslims and Kashmiri Pandits. We've really tried to kind of like gloss over certain irregularities that we have had uh, as communities which really led to the major distrust in 1990s and uh, their immigration and their persecution to which the persecution of other communities is also added and is also very visible and viable still thank you yeah these these are certainly really important you know, intersecting issues happening in kashmir um, and you know can see the patterns of them around the world so i think they are really important to bring to light you know and to talk about at, at the moment um i don't know whether we have time for another question what do you think america um i think shall we we just take maybe one more okay yeah is that so i have from valentina thank you for your work and your insights and 
You mentioned the power of collaborative voices of women who gather, though it may not be immediately perceived as such in a patriarchal society. I wonder if you could talk a little more about that and how you would how you work with that. What may be different considerations you make when foregrounding individual and communal voices in your work? And I think that just feeds on very nicely from where we're saying about how the tensions yeah. are pulling people apart, but we need to reconfigure how we mm-hmm. balance these individual interests with the communal and then how you <laughs> process that in your work. Well, I think, uh, you know, right now I might not be welcome in Kashmir because of the kind of work I'm doing and the kind of uh, perception around my work as sort of activism, academia, bordering on all sorts of things, engaged anthropology, also doing policy work while doing theoretical work. Um, But I did, you know, when I started my work and I know that a lot of researchers uh, I mean, I didn't need uh, uh, permission for research because, you know, I am a Kashmiri and I, at that time, I was also like, you know, just a local Kashmiri who was studying uh, Kashmir. And uh, the way I kind of like also was able to study what I did was thinking about women because it was very easy for a woman, for a mother to study what I did because it was thought as uh, it was contextualized as a woman just, you know, understanding, you know, women's issues. So, which is not really much. But I do write in the book that th- this really served me, uh, uh, the, w- what I studied was really a window into, which was completely not visible in the kind of work I was doing because it was undermined as doing women's issues. So that's how that's how it's kind of like you know, and undermined by maybe you know whoever was surveilling Kashmiri researchers at that time like you know this is just this is just doing women's work and I don't know she's working with half widows some kind of empowerment work so that's that's how it's it was kind of maybe went under the radar for some time but then uh, these are not easy issues if you are thinking about why are people disappeared by in a place which kind of talks about democracy like it's a democracy and then it's also imposed democracy which is just the politics and weaponization of democratic tools inside Kashmir how is it still able to disappear people like someone can be disappeared and killed in Kashmir and no one can ask questions and there is there is no law to kind of you know give you redresser because there's already a law present which says that if there is a suspicion against you you can be killed disappeared incarcerated detained humiliated harassed beaten uh, and everything is good because you know you're against the sovereignty of Indian nation state. So, so you you know in 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 that kind of mode, thinking about disappearances, which was really a movement led by women against the enforced disappearances, that was also not seen as much initially. It was just seen as a gathering of mothers who are coming together, which is why early on, um, e- even in the book, I think of it as politics of mourning. Because these are women gathering together to mourn their disappear, to mourn, quote unquote, who might be dead or who might turn alive, uh, who might come back alive. So I see it as politics of mourning and how that gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And from accidental activists who are using mourning as politics, they become full fledged human rights defenders from feminine consciousness, which was kind of imposed upon them by Western idiom of feminism they kind of turn to feminist consciousness where they know that they're activists, where they know their story matters, where they know that their everyday activism matters, everyday life is activism. So, you know, you see these uh, conversions happening in the course of a decade, and now it's more than a decade of that work. Uh, I kind of see them, uh, how they see them themselves individually and collectively. But then the saddest thing is uh, 2019 onwards, they haven't been able to do a lot of activism, visible activism, uh, because most of the activism in Kashmir now is um, termed as terrorism. And that's that's where things kind of uh, are in the moment. And I, I think that's what we have to so, sort of, uh, at, at this moment, one of the biggest um, analysis or one of the biggest clarifications that critical Kashmir studies, whether that be through ethnography, whether that be through any kind of non-fictive writing, 
or through different genres of uh, creative writing. That's the parsing that we are doing, that it's, it's really not terrorism. So to go back to the individual and collective solidarity work, um, how do you do solidarity with people in this moment? And how do you, I, I think one of the biggest hurdles that we are facing right now, I'm outside, not welcome inside Kashmir as much as I would like to be. How do you do solidarity with local groups? How do you do solidarity with individuals and collectives when people are not even able to write? If they are writing, even a Facebook post can get them detained. Even showing sympathy, there was a woman some months back, she actually liked a post that was against the Indian army in one way or the other. Their um, chief had been uh, killed in a, in a plane crash and she actually uh, put a happy emoji on that and she was suspended from her job. So when you have persecution happening on the basis of emojis, we have to really rethink, like uh, thinking about expression of people and thinking about activism, thinking about everyday activism, and then thinking about solidarity. At this moment, can we even expect people to be active in the way we think um, activists should be active? Uh, should we be imposing that kind of a burden on them? Uh, because you know, if, if they don't survive, then there is no act activism. Does that make sense? So I don't know if I'm getting the full essence of the question or if I'm even answering what they have asked. I think it's really valuable to think about these border crossings and you know like what what is an activist you know is if silence is, is your means to survival then you know this is an, it's an activist resistance stance so um, I think I think you've been incredibly insightful and just I, I can't thank you enough for the whole committee. I'm sure would would want to echo our thanks for your time, your really valuable um, answers to um, questions that you've expanded upon in, in a really full and really, really incredibly insightful way. Um, so thank you from us all. I don't know if Trang wants to echo or say more in the way of, of thanks, um, but Brilliant. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, the question of solidarity is really important. How how should how can we do it right? Basically, you know, how do in a way that are respectful and inclusive to everyone involved? You know, mm -hmm. so yeah, so absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, and just one last thing I want to say is that the next um, talk in the series will happen on the tenth of May, at the same time, so seven p.m. Uh, British Summer Time. So hopefully, I'll see many of you yet there. Yeah, thank you so much, Arthur. Thank you so yes. much, Shang, and thank you so much, Amir Kaur. And uh, I know like Alex and uh, Patricia and everyone involved in the organizing committee, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Okay.